This is the Memory Palace. I'm Nate DeMeo. A postcard from the road between Parlier and Fresno, California, March 24th, 1966. Someone had swept the floor. Someone had collected the soda cans from the picnic the night before. And someone had tied up the trash bags and asked their host where they keep their bins and took them out back. And then they all knelt for mass. And then they marched, as they had every day since they left Delano, for 12, 15 miles a day, onward to Sacramento, beneath the banners of the United States, and Mexico, and the Virgin of Guadalupe, and the United Farm Workers, the Black Thunderbird on white on red, drawn so simply anyone could draw it, printed on a sign that they could wave while they walked. There were 77 marchers when they left Delano. One man, a grape picker, a striker, a welguista like the rest of them, had gotten the flu and he had gone home. He didn't want to go home. There were a few hundred now, on this their eighth day, on a 300-mile journey up the backbone of California's Central Valley to its state capital, to demand the right to organize field workers as a union, to demand $1.40 an hour, to demand nothing short of human dignity. That's how Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez and Luis Valdez had framed it in their plan of Delano, their declaration of purpose, read aloud every night in every farm town on the road, and quoted to the reporters who followed them on foot, in a pack alongside the agents from the FBI, who were there to look for subversives, but who only found citizens. Marching up the 99, in the service roads through budding orchards and tilled tomato fields, they were marching because Chavez admired Martin Luther King, and the men and women who'd marched with him from Selma to Montgomery, they were marching because he'd admired Los Peregrinos on the road to La Basilica de Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, near where the Virgin had appeared to one Diego Cuoco Tuatzin, admired those pilgrims who journeyed, sometimes hundreds of miles, the last of them on their knees. They were marching because Chavez, like his church, believed that pain and penitence were intertwined, and because he knew they could do it, despite the heat and the miles and the blisters. He knew the marchers who would have the necessary endurance. All they had ever done was endure. They picked and planted and cut and tied and hauled. They had few worker protections, no job security, no minimum wage. They had spent their lives in the field in the heat and the cold, with no breaks and no bathrooms, often no trees to hide behind, just your fellow workers, walls of women who blocked the views of overseers. They had spent their lives bent forced most times to use an 18-inch hoe, not because it was the best tool for the job, but because they had to bend to use it, so the supervisors could catch them stretching or slacking. And because they spent their lives bent, they spent their lives hurt. They knew what one's body felt like after 12 hours of planting beet seeds four inches apart, or clipping thorny vines, or lugging hundred-pound sacks. They knew sexual assault, they knew skimmed wages, they knew squalid shacks, They knew waiting all morning in the hopes that they'd be picked by the foreman, that they'd be given the opportunity to spend another day bent. And because they spent their lives bent, Chavez knew they would stand when given the chance and could march as long as required. There were 77 marchers when they left Delano, men and women, old and young, nearly all of the Mexican-American grape pickers. Now there were nuns from the local parishes. There were activists from Berkeley looking for their next cause. There was a black man and a white man who'd come all the way from Mississippi and told the paper they'd grown tired of northerners coming down south to help them. It was time for them to help up north. There were the first Protestants that any of the pilgrims had ever met in real life. The first Jews. The first state legislators, too, there to score points in an election year. There was a guy from Wisconsin. He managed a Finnish language newspaper back home. He had come to California for vacation, the sun and the surf and the Sierras and all of it, but had read about the marchers in the paper, and now he was one of them. They had left Delano with sleeping bags and some clothes and signs and song sheets and no food. They trusted that there would be food in the next town, that there would be good people to take them in. And there always were, and floors to sleep on, Meals, home-cooked, brought and covered dishes. People lined the roads to cheer and to witness and to hand out water. The highway patrol was there to keep an eye on things, but 
They knew at this point there wasn't going to be any trouble. They just had to make sure no one wandered into traffic as the marchers made their way through Steinbeck country. The Golden Valley unfurling, flanked by sunburned foothills. Kids cut school to spend the day on the road. Mothers brought little ones so they could tell them one day that they'd marched. Workers left the fields and joined the pilgrims. For a day, for a mile, for a block, for as long as they thought they could get away with, before heading back to their rows and their quotas, bent while the banners disappeared over the horizon. In eight more days, the marchers would arrive in Sacramento on Easter Sunday, and they would be 8,000 strong. So many farm workers and activists and well-wishers would join them that it would take an hour for everyone to cross the bridge over the low river at the edge of the city. By then, one of the growers, one of the grape companies, would agree to recognize their union. There would be other victories in the future. And losses. There would be plenty. There would be other marches. And hunger strikes when the marches stopped getting headlines. There would be factions and fractures in the farm workers organization. And in the organizations, those factions and fractures would yield. There would be steps back and steps forward. There would be a day off of work every year for Californians for Cesar Chavez's birthday. And there would still be so much to do. But they didn't know that then, as they walked in the sun on the roads by the fields they knew so well. They just knew they could endure. And they knew how seeds took root. And they marched on. The Memory Palace is produced by me, Nate DeMeo, with research assistance from Andrea Milne, and with engineering assistance from my brand new engineering assistant, Alyssa Dudley. Thank you to the shocking number of people who applied for that position. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to get back to each of you individually. The Memory Palace is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, which gets ad-serving technology from AdZerk and support from the Knight Foundation, MailChimp, and from listeners just like you. And for those of you looking toward the end of the year, any donation is tax deductible. You can go to thememorypalace.org and click on donate. You can also find a link there to t-shirts for your highly specific gift giving needs. And before I go, I want to tell you about a new member of the Radiotopia family, the West Wing Weekly, from my dear friend Rishikesh Hirway, from the wonderful Song Exploder podcast, and Josh Molina, who played Will Bailey on the West Wing. Each episode breaks down each episode of the TV show in order, which is fun, but the thing I really appreciate about the show is the interviews the guys do along with the analysis. Not only do you get to hear from people involved in making the show, like Alison Janney or Bradley Whitford or Aaron Sorkin, they have these fascinating conversations sometimes with folks who've worked in the White House or who currently sit in Congress or work with the military, who bring the issues from the episodes into focus. It's a cool show, and if it sounds like something you might be into, then I'm pretty sure you're going to be into it, so check it out. You can find The West Wing Weekly on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Meanwhile, you can find me on Twitter or Facebook at The Memory Palace. And thanks for listening. Radiotopia.